So hi, everyone. My name is Valentina. I'm um, calling in from Hong Kong. And um, I'm really excited to be part of this. I did an actual, like a real live um, unconference a few months ago, like a year ago. And it was an amazing, uh, amazing event. So I'm very grateful for the organizers to invite me again. Um, so this particular talk that I wanted to put together was really to talk about relationships. So I'm a dating and relationship coach. And uh, this um, last few months, the last few months have been like a really interesting time for me and my clients. And I wanted to share some of the observations and uh, the lessons that um, I've observed um, throughout my personal life and that of my clients uh, in the last, whatever, five months of this year. And um, I really want to talk about the impact that, the positive impact that the pandemic has had on relationships from my perspective, from where I come from. So I work with both singles and couples. And uh, in my work, what I focus mostly on is in helping people develop their intimacy skills. Because as you probably noticed in your life, there are not really many places where we actually learn about how to be in a relationship, how to be vulnerable, how to be authentic and to truly communicate who we are. And of course, in a relationship, I call relationships people growing machines, because I believe that through a partnership that we create with another person, we are able to discover who we really are, if we're willing to do that, if we're willing to open up and to experience ourselves through the eyes of the other person. So because we are mirrors of each other, because we attract the kind of people that represent, that, that join our energetic um, vibration, shall we say. Uh, many people are wondering, why do I keep attracting a certain type of relationship? Why do things keep happening to me? In For me, it is because, um, you know, we need that experience in life. The universe gives us that experience so we can learn something meaningful about ourselves. And this situation has been called many, many things like a reset button, um, the great pause. And I feel that the, the biggest gift we have received from the universe in the last few months has been this opportunity to rediscover ourselves, to look at ourselves in a very, from a different perspective and to try to get an, another, to discover another aspect of our personality, who we really are. So today, I mean, I would like to, to have a conversation with you guys if, you're, if you want to share some of your experiences of intimacy and what have you learned about your relationships in the last few months, because I see this as a big opportunity for us to reinvent the way we look at relationships and to learn a few important lessons. Um, so if anybody wants to share, just raise your hand or pop up on the screen. And let's explore what was the biggest lesson, what was the one thing that you have learned about yourself and about your relationship in the last few months. I'm very happy to share some of my learning and lessons, but I would like to hear from you if there's anybody that wants to share something. If not, it's okay. But I don't want to be the only one talking if you guys have something um, that has happened for you in your relationship that has brought a new level of understanding. So first of all, what is intimacy? What, does, what do we actually mean when we talk about intimacy? And what do we mean when we talk about connection? Um, there are many different interpretation of what it means to connect with another human being and how we are able to love this other person. And maybe multiple people, it doesn't have to be restricted to one. But I feel one of the most important lessons of the last few months has been the, to understand or be reminded of the importance of human connection. Wherever you are in the world, you may be 
you may be stuck in isolation and quarantine. I have clients all over the world and they tell me that they haven't seen another human being in person in real flesh for several weeks, uh, sometimes months. Um, us here in Hong Kong are very fortunate that we, we have pretty much all the freedom that we had before. Um, and next week they're going to lift all restrictions. Everybody will be able to do everything that they want. But even in this period where we haven't had very severe isolation, um, we have all rediscovered the, how important it is to us as humans to connect with each other. I think it gave us this, for me, the, the image that I have in my mind, what I think, how interconnected we are. It made us realize that each human is actually the equivalent uh, of a cell, of an actual cell in our body, because we all function, we all have a meaning, we all have a purpose, we all are meant to contribute to our society in one way or another, but it's the, the bigger, the body of our entire human population that really makes the body of our planet. So I think it brought back some of this new understanding of what really uh, what we're really trying to achieve here on this planet through relationships, through connections. And there's been all this before Corona, how technology was preventing us from connecting with each other, how it was disconnecting us because we were spending too much time on our devices. And the beauty of the last few months has been to bring technology back to maybe um, its original purpose, which was, in my opinion, that of um, that of connecting us, of enabling human connection, and that has been an interesting lesson for a lot of people who are now discovering that you can actually have dates, you can actually go and have parties just on Zoom, and it's so powerful to know that even without seeing each other in person, we can still create. Hi, Pi. Just letting you know that they're hoping you could join a little bit early. Okay, if you're sharing. Well, I mean, right now it's 107, and we're going to, you're starting. I'm going to mute you. <laughs> um, okay, so actually, I wanted to really continue talking about this. And if you do have any questions or if you want to ask questions and make comments about where what I'm talking about, please do raise your hand. Um, so, I feel that until this has happened, until we were prevented to meet people in person, to actually go on dates, to uh, meet the people we loved, we were taking each other for granted. And there's a thing that you know, we've always known, but we never really maybe taken seriously that you don't know what you got till it's gone. We, we that were there in our life for granted, including our partners. So a lot of the work that I've been doing lately has been to help couples um, manage isolation with the significant other and really rediscover themselves and their partner in the context of this imposed, um, you know, 24 seven living in each other's pocket situation because one of the, uh, the direct consequences of our lifestyle, uh, of our busy lifestyle anywhere else in the world, I suppose, but in particular in Hong Kong, has been that we got so busy that we have become a lot less present to our relationship. Earlier on, I, I caught the end of Chris's talk and he was talking about how breath can bring you into your body and you can be very connected to yourself. And the idea of being present in the moment had kind of disappeared um, in many ways from our lives. More, more and more couples were coming to say, oh, my husband is never present. He ignores me or she, my wife, um, ignores me. I feel, I feel that we're not communicating with each other in a way like we used to. And now, people have been forced to, to live in each other's pockets, to be so close and realize that actually they didn't know each other. They didn't remember who they were when they first got together. And that voyage of discovery 
has been uh, a really interesting experience for a lot of people. Uh, rediscovering intimacy, rediscovering the ability to be vulnerable with each other, especially that, you know, if you remember that um, intimacy is a lot about vulnerability and revealing things that we are not necessarily proud of. So the whole idea of uh, one of our biggest fears in life is uh, that we are not uh, we are not good enough for our partners, that if they truly saw us, they, if they truly, if we let someone that to look into our soul, they might actually not like what they see out there. Um, but that is the whole mirror concept that I was talking about. The idea that you actually see in each other's soul and you are able to understand all these deepest fears, all these weaknesses, and ultimately, love is a whole uh, beautiful, energetic exchange where by sharing vulnerabilities and mistakes and failures and fears, we are able to understand each other as human in a, in a very deep and meaningful way. And what is this concept of fear? What are we actually afraid of? The last few months has been uh, very uh, full of anxiety and worry and we all try to make sense of what's happening in the world and figure out where we were going. A lot of people still live in with a lot of anxiety, a lot of um, fear of the future, of course, a lot of the economic factors that create anxiety for us have caused a lot of issues. I'm hearing a lot of noise, but that's okay. So all these things have created an opportunity at the same time. Of course, there is a crisis going on, but I believe that there is an opportunity in every crisis. And the opportunity has been this self-discovery, this idea of understanding each other's vulnerabilities. Maybe I'm gonna share something that I have on my screen just so that it maybe um, gives you an opportunity to see what's going on for me. What I was talking about is this idea that we now have the opportunity to create more intimacy in life, in our life, uh, understanding each other better, and understanding that our feeling of not being good enough um, comes from our fear of being seen. And the most important aspect of intimacy is actually being able to reveal our weaknesses. So when we had busy lives, when we had lots of different things in our lives, we forgot how to be vulnerable. We forgot how to create this connection with our partners. And we didn't really know how to go back, how to travel into time, you know, into the time when we felt connected, when, when things were going well between us. But this situation, the global situation, opportunity to create this connection by, by sharing the struggle. Now we're all, we say we're all in this together. We are going through this anxious, worrisome time, through this fearful moment in our lives. And that actually in itself creates human connection, not just between partners, but between everybody around the world. Um, it gives us an opportunity to see who the other people in our life truly are. So a lot of people have rediscovered a very old connection many times in the last few months. And a lot of questions and letters and video calls from people who we knew before, but maybe we haven't been in touch for a long time. And this uh, uh, ability or opportunity to reconnect has created a lot of interesting moments for a lot of people around the world. But to me, connection and intimacy is not really about the things that we do, but how we actually show up for others, what, what we are and who we are in our relationships. Very often we define ourselves in our relationship through I'm someone's mother, daughter, wife. And yes, that has been the way that you introduce yourself potentially to other people. 
but a lot of the work that I've seen happening at the moment, the self-development work and growth has been about trying to understand who I really am as a person. What do I actually bring to the world? In what way can I serve? In what way can I help other people? And I think this is just such an amazing thing. So if you want to play this little game with me, I'd like to talk a little bit about fear, the fears that we have in a relationship. There are some fundamental and very conflicting fears that we usually experience. And I'd like you to take a few moments and think about what are your three fears? What are you most afraid of in a relationship? And obviously it can be romantic, but it, it, it doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. It can be the fears that you have with your parents or friends or whatever. Um, and then if you have a partner, I like you to imagine or to think about what do you think they are afraid of? Of course, we have some fundamental fear of judgment, of death, and all of these things that we are born with. But the reality of fear, you know, I love the acronym that says that fear actually means false evidence appearing real. The reality of fear is that it's what we project in the future. It's, it's almost like as if we copy our past events like if we take a block of all our past events and the meaning that we made of them with the beliefs that we have created based on past events and literally paste them into the future. If, if time was just a line in front of you and you're sitting in one point in time, the, the current, the present now, if you like, fear is literally copying past events and posting them, pasting them into the future and then living as if the past will be repeated. Um, so fear is really a projection, is really our imagination creating all these monsters. So the things that we're actually afraid of is what the future might hold, the fact that we're not able to control other people, that other people might not like us and they might reject us. We're afraid of actually not being loved back after we give everything to a person because romantic love comes with conditions. I love you if you love me back. And when we're actually not able to tell our truth to our partner, it's not because we're afraid of what we're going to say, but we are actually afraid of their reaction. And we're afraid of their reaction because we are taking a past event, a past moment when we've told them something meaningful and they didn't give us the answer that we wanted. Maybe we felt judged, maybe we felt criticized. And that projection is what stops us. It, it blocks us from creating a new version of the future because we never say what we're actually thinking. We feel that we are outside of this reality that we don't know how to create. So these are some examples of fears that people experience in relationships. Um, many people come and say, I, I am really afraid of intimacy. I am emotionally unavailable. Um, of course, we all fear rejection because being the interdependent animals that we were created to be, the most important thing for for our survival is to have other people that are supporting us, that have our back. And literally rejection in our primitive brain is seen as um, being ejected or rejected from, um, from the tribe, which means that our death is imminent because we're not able to protect ourselves if other people are not there for us. Fear of not being loved back is another fundamental fear because we believe that only by being loved by someone else do we really understand how to love ourselves. Because it's impossible for us psychologically to understand who we are if we don't see that, that love, that acceptance in someone else's eyes and heart. Um, of course, we're all born with the fear of not being good enough, um, which can be a barrier to our development, but it can also be an amazing motivator um, and when we deal with growth, we can take two ways of dealing with not being good enough. We can either stay in the victim position in which we confirm all our biggest fear that yes, people have told me that I'm not good enough, so I'm just going to prove them right. I'm just not even going to try because clearly I'm never going to make it. Or we can take what I call the hero route, the choice 
to take our life into our own hands and to prove to ourselves and to other people that we are good and that we are adding value to the world. But also in relationships, the, the opposite of uh, fear of rejection is by giving too much, we are often afraid of giving too much of ourselves, um, that losing ourselves. So many couples, especially in the last few months, have come to, to coaching, to the sessions that we were doing together and said, I don't even know who I am anymore. I've lost that person that I was when I entered this relationship. And it's a natural tendency we have in a relationship to merge our personality with our partner to to start becoming more like them is part of creating the connection and the rapport of being with someone but after a while of creating this you know we the concept of we from two individuals we really lose the the me we we lose who we really are and this opportunity is actually to create this uh, a new version of ourselves uh, of course we have fear of judgment a lot of um, a lot of the barriers that we have to communication come from the fact that if we truly told our partner everything we are afraid that they might not like us and they would judge us and therefore reject us and abandon us so i'd like to give you five you know, ways that I've used in my work in terms of creating a deeper connection with your partner. So first of all, one of the key issues that we have uh, in terms of communication is that we, when we are hurt, when we are not very sure of what's happening in our life, when we feel rejected because we've created this a projection or this perception that something is happening that doesn't match whatever our idea of uh, partnership is, we tend to be angry, we tend to blame our partner, we tend to complain about the things that they do or they don't do. And the way that we communicate this is usually by saying, oh, it's all your fault. You're always doing this. You're never doing that. Why can't you be more like this? Why can't you do this for me? So the thing is, the way our primitive brain reacts to these kind of statements is by feeling attacked. And of course, our, all our survival instinct, of course, when your partner says, why can't you be home on time for dinner? It doesn't mean that they're going to kill us, but it's still a judgment and a rejection and a criticism. So we react uh, with defensiveness, we react with uh, criticism with judgment, we fight back, we blame them. So one key way that I teach my clients um, in terms of communication skills is really to, to switch from blaming and complaining in terms of in when we are trying to express our emotions to what is called the I message feedback or the I statement, which is really focusing on our experience because communication is about sharing is about sharing my feelings to you in a way that you understand and therefore we create a bridge between connection can only happen if you truly understand how i feel if i blame you and i complain about what you're doing things are not going to work because essentially you are not going to listen to me but if i share my feelings if i share how vulnerable i am when something is happening um, you are going to listen a lot more and you're going to pay attention and you're going to maybe give me compassion and love and understanding as opposed to defensiveness and rejection and criticism. So if you want to express something that is happening, you can start by saying, I feel really hurt when um, you are rejecting me or when you're not talking to me because I make it to mean that I don't matter to you. And what I really need is to actually feel important in your life. So when you communicate it in this way, as opposed to you never listen to me, you always ignore me, and you always make me feel very bad about what's going on. If I communicate it that way, my partner is not going to pay attention. So if you use this concept of I message feedback and avoid uh, accusing the partner or blaming the partner, they are going to be more likely to listen to you because they are not getting triggered. They're not going to feel attacked. 
So there is more of an opportunity to create this bridge of communication by better listening. Um, once we do this, it, how do we actually communicate intimate things? How do you rediscover what your partner has become? Because if you've been in a long-term relationship, and by long-term relationship, I mean anything beyond a year or two years, you may have realized that if you look back, you are no longer the person that you were in the beginning of that relationship. And the, the same is true for your partner. Essentially, for me, a balanced uh, a relationship that is going to um, run for a long time, is going to go the distance, is a relationship in which both partners continue to grow together as opposed to growing apart. And when we become less present, when we don't communicate on a regular basis about deep, meaningful stuff, when we make all our lives about the kids, the school, the job, how much money we have, who's going to pay the bills, or these important but rather functional aspects of our communication, we don't actually learn anything new about what is really happening for our partner. So one of the very interesting um, tools that I use sometimes is, is this concept of 36 questions to fall in love, which I usually uh, recommend to my single clients, but I think they're really, really powerful reconnection tools when you are in a long-term relationship. And the, in these 36 questions, which go from like, I'm gonna give you some examples here, sorry. Um, given the choice of anyone in the world, who would you want as a dinner guest? This seems, silly and boring, but it's actually a great question because what hides behind this, this concept of having an, an someone who is a meaningful dinner guest for you is actually revealing who inspires you, what makes you uh, excited about the world. So for me, this lady in the picture is Esther Perel, who is probably the world's most famous relationship expert. And I would be fascinated to have a conversation with her because I'm so um, in alignment with her thinking. But for other people, it could be anyone else. And if I share this about myself with a partner, whether they are a lifelong partner or someone that I've just met, it actually tells them something important about my values, my interests, what I really care about in life. Another question is, what would be a perfect day? This is a wonderful exercise to do with a partner to really write a story about what a perfect day looks like because so many times we take each other for granted, assuming that we know what our partner wants and loves and we really don't understand anything about them. But describing a perfect day and exploring a perfect day with each other to see how do we fit in each other's lives? What is the, the role that we assign to our partner? Are they just someone who are, is helping me taking care of the children? Or is it someone who inspires me, someone who helps me grow, someone who I can do yes. amazing things with? That is yeah, yeah. At the end, I couldn't really talk about, oh yeah, well, I'm, I'm on room six now. Um, so when you look into this concept of discovering what a perfect day means for someone, it gives you a chance to really understand who they are right now. Um, next question that is quite interesting, I think, in, in this moment in life, you know, when we feel um, negative, when we feel anxious and worried, one of the best ways of getting back into some sense of balance and um, you know normal life it's very important to have a practice of gratitude um, so asking yourself and your partner what do you feel the most grateful for right now and sharing that with your partner you know and you don't have to say it oh I'm very grateful that I have you in my life if it's not true but of course for many people in this moment of difficulties having someone that you can rely on that literally has your back that is there to help you with everyday tasks you know many of us have rediscovered parenthood what it really means to be a parent to to teach your children everything and that has been a pretty harsh lesson for many people who maybe were not used to being there for the children all the time and maybe they don't feel the gratitude for that, this experience but actually sharing what you are grateful for at the end of every day with your partner is one of the deepest most connecting experiences you can have and sometimes it's hard to come up with things to be grateful for 
but literally even for your peace of mind, for your ability to go to sleep and to stop the overthinking and the worry and the anxiety, literally thinking about the, what you are grateful for every single day at the end of the day before you fall asleep is one of the best ways of waking up full of energy and full of positivity and hope that things will get better. Because the last thing that comes into our mind is the first thing that we wake up with. Um, then... The next question, and this, I'm not only giving you like five of them because um, I just want you to re maybe think about them for yourself and maybe have this conversation with your partner. I know this is a little bit, uh, it seems uh, negative, but actually it is an important question to ask yourself. You know, if you knew that you will die suddenly anytime soon in one year or whatever, what would you change about the way you're living right now? And I think in these particular moments in our life, we do need to think about what's important to us. What are those things that we would do if we knew we only had a short time to live? Because first of all, we want meaning, more meaning in our life. We want to rediscover what it means to feel alive and to feel excited and passionate about the world. And if we had this knowledge, this ability to read the future, which actually would be a disaster in my opinion, but at least we would have an idea of what it means to move um, beyond this. Okay. Next session is starting. Um, so am I supposed to stop? Can someone tell me what's going on? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. If you have any questions, I'll stay on the line for a little bit, but thank you for your time and thank you for listening. And if you have any comments or any questions, just let me know.